Well, welcome to November, Team Healthy. Today, uh, we all hopefully survived Halloween <laughs> last night. Hope you all had a fun time. I see somebody was talking about um, somebody giving out broccoli at Halloween. My goodness, what's going on there? Uh, they don't know kids if they're giving out broccoli, right? Hey, last night we had a fun time. Uh, it, it, um, uh, the neighborhood that my daughter lives in is only about 10 minutes away from here. So Jennifer, my wife, and I went over to their house and uh, we kind of split everything up. Uh, Jennifer stayed inside with the newborn, uh, Lyra. Uh, and so uh, uh, our daughter and her husband, Cleet, took off and uh, took Lorelai, the five-year-old, out trick-or-treating. And they put me on the front porch. And uh, I was passing out candy. And I had a little table there. And that neighborhood just goes all out. So they've got tons of kids that were out there. So I just stayed outside. So we had everybody split up. And, and I told Lorelai, the five-year-old, I said, now you understand that Pop's favorite candy is uh, Reese's peanut butter cups. And then Cleet, my son-in-law said, well, that happens to be my favorite candy too. So Lorelai was kind of on the lookout for that. And so when she got back in, the first thing we did is we poured out all of her candy and she had three uh, different uh, Reese's uh, peanut butter cups. And so she was very kind. She gave one to Pop, she gave one to Daddy, and then she kept one for herself. So I had some Reese's peanut butter cups last night. And sure enough, there's a reason why that's my favorite. It's pretty good. Anyway, I hope you guys had a happy Halloween last night. Today is uh, All Saints Day, where we're remembering those who have gone before us uh, in this past year. My father died in May, and so I'm remembering him today. Uh, my mother died 15 years ago. So, uh, that, you know, it's a cycle of life, isn't it? And uh, one of these days, it's going to be you and me, isn't it? So I hope that we leave a good legacy behind, right? Hey, today, I, I've, I'm going to be talking about my persistent narcissistic patterns to watch for. And I was absolutely <laughs> just astounded by the wide variety of the questions that came in today, because each one shows a, a, a distinct element of narcissism that we need to be aware of. One of the things we know is that when you have this craving for control and this entitlement and the selfishness and manipulation, et cetera, that's part of the narcissistic uh, pattern, there are so many combinations of ways that it can play out, which is why I haven't, uh, um, I haven't um, uh, lost any um, momentum trying to get some, uh, some videos out because there's so much to comment on. And we're going to see today how many different ways that the patterns of narcissism can play out. But here's the deal. When you're on Team Healthy, one of the things that we're trying to do we're trying to have a good sense of education so that we're we're part of the ones that say, well, wait a minute, I'm onto it. I see it. I know it. I realize what their tricks are and what they're trying to accomplish. And I'm going to go into a different direction. So that's what we're going to do here. And so I, I want to just jump right in because like I say, I have so much here that we want to cover in our time together. And let, let's just look at the many, many different dimensions that we're talking about. Uh, and by the way, those of you who have uh, questions, put them in the comment section. It really helps me to know you when you give these uh, questions. So, and know that even if your question is not answered in one of these, I still pick up on ideas from uh, the comments and all that you have for my videos. So I, I genuinely like hearing from you. Okay. The first questioner says, what could be causing a, a person to get extremely triggered when I told her of my husband's plan to have major surgery, she got very agitated and it lasted for several days. I don't think it's from being concerned about him. She's been overtly trying to get me upset, even saying, you don't seem very upset. Come on, what's wrong with you? Uh, with frustration and anger in her voice. So you have this woman, uh, the person who's writing the question that says, my, my husband's going to have some major surgery very soon. And this other person, instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, is this something that was unexpected or tell me about it? Or how are you doing? Or is there any way I can help showing some regard? It says that she becomes agitated and, uh, and holds on to that agitation for days. And then she wants to try to get you to be upset saying you don't seem to be very upset. I'm going to be honest. That's just strange. Okay. That's odd. Who would say, uh, you know, uh, who would do something like this when someone's having some surgery and, and you, you may have had surgery yourself. You've had other people uh, and it's just first nature. You would think 
to say I'm, I'm concerned or how may I help, et cetera. The pattern that we have here from this woman who is uh, doing the, the, uh, the triggering is this person clearly has zero sense of empathy. Okay. One of the patterns of narcissism is the inability to step inside another person's emotions or needs or uh, perceptions and say, I'd like to know you from your frame of reference. That's what empathy is. Uh, instead, uh, this person is thinking, well, if I have to do that and try to show understanding, then that means I'm having to put some attention on someone else that's not me. And th this is an astonishing illustration about how, but I need to be the center of attention. And so uh, I, I can't tune into someone else because it, it just doesn't fit who I am. And then in addition, we can also see that it's exposing her. Here, our, our questioner says, well, I'm, I'm dealing with uh, surgery inside my immediate family and my marriage. And, uh, and the, the narcissistic person is thinking, I don't know what to do. When you say something like that, I, I'm not real sure how I'm supposed to respond. And, and it illustrates the utter ineptitude that some of these individuals have when it comes to having some true, good, healthy uh, coping skills or just relating skills. They don't know how to do it. I have a, um, a video coming up pretty soon about uh, why conflict with narcissists will collapse pretty much every time. And it comes down to, uh, we have different levels of communication. We have, um, uh, we, we have uh, functions, rules and regulations, values and, and standards that, that guide us. And then we have empathy and we have immersion. And when you come to that place where you're looking at your values and your standards, and then maybe you have some strain or, or uh, uh, challenges in there, narcissists fall back on function and rules and regulations. They don't know how to go into empathy. And that's what that whole thing about uh, uh, conflicts collapsing with them. But this person is basically saying, I, I have no idea uh, what I'm supposed to do. And, uh, and then the fact that she's kind of goading this person to go into anger, it's her way of actually saying, well, I'm defined by anger and not kindness. And, and so maybe you need to just follow my lead. This is kind of a strange one, but I wanted to, uh, to use this one as we started off to let you know, that's what you're dealing with. These people really, uh, they don't take the time to know you and understand you in a loving and caring kind of way. It's all about them. And then to top it off, she wants to, uh, to trigger anger in you. And when you come up with something like this, just know that you're dealing with a, a very diminished kind of person uh, who doesn't have good skills. That's not the person that you're going to want to take some cues from and realize whatever she's got going on, it's not about you. And she's revealing just how shallow uh, her approach toward life really is. She doesn't have the skill set. Now, another question. This person says, and this is going to reveal a little bit of a different pattern, um, but we're going to see this. How do narcissists have no sense of self if they're so selfish? <laughs> okay, that's a pretty, uh, you're using some straight up logic on there. This, uh, the narcissist has no sense of self, and yet they're so selfish. My ex is begging for forgiveness and being very honest about seeing her faults and seeing the way that she treated me. But I'm not sure if it's just one more deception telling me what I want to hear. Okay. So apparently we have a, a situation where he says it's, a, it's his ex. And so they may have been very recently divorced or they're separated or, but uh, this person is, uh, the, the, uh, the relationship has shifted some. And so now the ex-wife is saying, hey, look, I know I've made mistakes and I've, I've, I'm sorry and I wish I hadn't done this. And he's kind of confused. It's like, well, uh, she's so, so selfish in the past. And then he says, uh, uh, do they have no sense of self? Actually, the, the pattern is they have a distorted sense of self. Okay. And so uh, what you can see is narcissists have this notion that says, well, actually there are important people in the world. And then there's me. Uh, there are people that need to be given attention. And then I need to have a little bit more. Uh, they have such an attitude of selfishness and uniqueness and entitlement. And finally, apparently this husband decided I, I can't keep doing this. And it uh, kind of blew up the strategy of this woman. 
And so her pattern is one of entitlement. And so here she's coming back, seemingly saying, well, uh, let me tell you what I did wrong. Now, uh, I've got a couple of thoughts with respect to that. Every now, people ask me, can narcissists ever, ch ever change? The answer is the percentage is low, but sometimes you have a low percentage of people who, uh, of a narcissistic bent who in fact can go into some of that change process. And keep in mind, it's, it's pretty low. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is when she says, uh, you know, I, I want you to give me another chance or I, I, want, I want you to hear me out. Uh, first thing I'm going to ask is give me some specifics. Uh, what, what are you talking about? When you look back and you say that you were selfish or that there were some things that were wrong, uh, enumerate it for me and, and see how particular, because if they just kind of go broad, it's like, I know I was difficult or uh, we don't need to argue like we used to. That, that's a little bit too broad and vague. I want something very specific. When I would call you names, that was me being uh, very condescending and I was looking for ways to hurt, but I realized that arise from my own sense of hurt, you know, something like that. Uh, and then uh, I would uh, take it a little bit further and I would ask, well, tell me some examples of how you would like things to be different. You know, what priorities, what preferences do you intend to, uh, to focus on and then see how uh, clearly she's going to be able to enumerate that. And then, and this is the clincher, give it time. Uh, if she's saying, I want to prove to you that I'm a nice person, that I'm decent. Uh, if you're so inclined, and particularly if there might be kids involved and you don't want to blow everything up, then it may be that you'll spend a little bit of time, but don't go quick. Because typically uh, in, in dating, as an example, narcissists are known just for uh, glomming onto you pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, and, and so you don't want to go quick. And you want to let her know uh, what I'd like since we are so far into this separation that we're not living together and uh, perhaps even a divorce has happened. Uh, I want to let time show what's going to, uh, uh, what's going to come. And then I would take six months, even a year, just kind of let, let the pattern show itself. And then if she can say, you know what, I, I get that and that makes sense. Uh, uh, then, Okay, let's see what happens. Now, if they start saying, well, you don't have to just stretch it out forever. I'm like, okay, I'm on to it. And so uh, basically you're asking her to A, lay down her, her aspect or the pattern of entitlement and then lay down the, uh, the pattern of no vulnerability. That's another pattern that's very common in narcissism and have specifics, have particulars, and then uh, let's go with patience on that and see what happens with it. Um, there, there are some times and, and I've had some uh, pretty good illustrations through the years, uh, not as much as I'd like, but uh, where uh, that one highly narcissistic person comes back and then later on says, you know, I, I've, I've been taken to school and I've, I'm, I, there's so many things that I knew that I needed to co come to terms with. And it's through this crisis that brought me to that place. It can happen. But uh, but make sure that uh, that you don't just jump right in and say, well, since you declare yourself to be healed, then uh, let's just go back to normal. Uh, have the particulars and then have patience. Now, this next one, uh, it, it, there's there's a particular element here, a pattern here that I want you to be aware of, because uh, th this is this is more common than you might think. This person says. Can a narcissistic partner maintain the facade of being kind and caring for a period of years before their traits actually come out? Would eight or nine years be out of the question? Or is it possible for a psychological crunch point in their life to trigger someone's narcissistic behaviors? So you have somebody that's like, well, I've been living with this person, let's say nine years, and it didn't really show up a lot. Because uh, they, they did seem to be helpful and kind and pleasant. But then something started happening and that person became more and more selfish. What, what was going on then in that eight or nine year period of time leading up to this? Was that just all phony? One of the huge things that, um, uh, that can be a part, especially of the covert narcissistic variety, is th they're masters at suppressing their emotion. Uh, uh, covert narcissists learned a long time ago that if you reveal who you are, if you become vulnerable, if you share your needs and thoughts and all, then uh, uh, you're not going to get too far because it's going to come back on you. And so they learn to play the game. It's the false self. And this is a classic case of this. 
And I'm going to guess that this person strongly learned uh, suppression is my ace in the hole. Uh, not letting anybody see who I really am and uh, who knows what they're nursing. But the fact that it starts coming out and apparently in a pretty potent way, eight or nine years into it, it illustrates I can't keep doing this forever. Or also there's kind of what we would refer to as a, a type of midlife crisis that could happen, be happening. You know, the older you get into your adult years, uh, then, uh, it's just kind of known that you hit 40 and everybody says, well, here comes the red sports car and all of that. Uh, but sometimes as people age, they begin thinking, you know, I'm going to rethink some of these old strategies and I'm going to rethink how I, uh, learn to cope and this business of me suppressing, I'm done with that. I, I don't want to keep doing it. And so they can come out with their narcissism later on and, uh, and, you know, who knows what triggered it. It may be that, uh, you know, the, when the shine wears off of a relationship and the kids get difficult or, uh, there are all sorts of, um, uh, uh, pressures uh, from work, or there may be some other, uh, possibilities out there that they hadn't, uh, uh, been privy to, let's say, you know, people out there partying and playing and all like that. It's like, you know, I, I've been so suppressed for so long. I, I want to go do that. Uh, there are many different possibilities, but this is a very common theme. And the, uh, uh, the basic uh, thing that we're going to say is covert narcissists in particular have a real uh, powerful motive, if you will, so that they can cover themselves to be suppressive, but, but you just can't hold it forever. And it is going to show up. And so, yes, uh, that can be something. And it's, it's, it's kind of um, <clears throat> disheartening to think, you mean to tell me that for all these years it was fake and phony? And the answer is to a certain extent, yes. You know, part of that person may have believed that goodness and friendliness and helpfulness was good, but over time, if it's if they really believe it, they're going to sustain it. But uh, uh, it shows itself to be more of an act than it is a deeply held conviction that they are operating off of. Very interesting pattern that we have there. Okay. Um, now here we go with a, um, uh, this, this one narcissist is asking questions that just drive me nuts. Um, this, this person says, my mom would say things like, where did you learn to think like that? Or who told you to think like that? Okay. And when I say stuff like that it drives me nuts, there are times when people will ask questions and they don't really want to know the answer. Uh, they ask questions because they're making a condescending point. And that's what's going on here. Well, who told you to think like that? Or where'd you come up with an idea like that? Um, and then, uh, then she also comes up with lame excuses. I constantly feel disconnected and not heard. So what we have here, when you have a mother speaking to an adult daughter, and uh, she's coming up with, where'd you come up with that? Or why do you think that way? Um, this illustrates, first of all, an attitude of entitlement. It's like, well, if you're going to be my child, even if you're the adult, you need to keep filtering it through me. And so the fact that you may have an idea or a priority or a preference, that's not the same as what she would have. It's like, um, I thought we had an agreement here that you filter everything through me. You don't, you don't remember that email? And so there, uh, the, the question is not really meant to, to, uh, to elicit information. It's meant to make a statement. Uh, you've strayed a little bit too, off, too far off of the path that I've established for you. Get back on the path. And then also uh, another pattern that this illustrates, first is entitlement, but the second one is there's a defensiveness. Uh, rather than saying we're, we're showing ourselves to be different right now. And I'd like to hear from you. How about that? Uh, you seem to be uh, coming up with ideas or preferences or opinions that are not the same as, as what I've had in the past. Uh, help me out. What, what's, what's going on inside of you and what would you like for me to know? That would be the mark of an open person. The mark of someone that says, uh, I lead with acceptance. Uh, even when we have difference, I accept the fact that you are what you are. Narcissists are far too invested in defensiveness. They keep their walls very thick and very high and very uh, uh, strict. 
And it's like, I don't reveal things about myself. I don't want to bring my walls down. I don't want to learn. I don't need to learn. And so even though there's an entitlement and a you owe me kind of a mindset, what it's really uh, illustrating is a pattern of fear. I, I'm, I, I'm afraid when you show yourself to be too other for me. And so uh, what she's basically saying is, I don't want you to grow. I, I want you to conform and stay inside these tight grooves. And you're over there thinking, okay, does that make any sense to me? And I'm hoping as a member of Team Healthy, it's like, well, you would think that growth is something that's a lifelong process, right? And this person is saying, no, stay back in that childlike state and I'm going to be just happy. I, I had a, a, a guy that I spoke to and uh, one of his parents actually said to him, uh, I don't know what the, the situation was, but the parents said, I thought I brought you up better than this. And this guy's saying to me, I'm 60 years old. And my father's still saying, I thought I brought you up better than this. And it's like, no, I, I have to stay in charge. And that's the entitlement. And it's like, you know, if, if that's what's required for us to have a relationship, it is not going to be a very deep relationship. And uh, I, I'm not going to play the role of the underling, um, but particularly, you know, uh, when you have so many other interests and, and skills, et cetera, that you can draw upon. No, thank you. But that's the pattern that we're talking about there. Um, okay, we have we have another one. And uh, this one, I, I, I did a recent uh, video on uh, the narcissist who had that really strong mean streak. Um, this person says, why are narcissists so mean to those who are kind and loving to them? So, and, and I'm making the assumption that this person is saying, and that kind and loving person is me. So I try to act nice. I try to be uh, friendly and remember, you know, important dates and do favors and, and uh, just show a, a sense of goodness and, you know, offer up uh, compliments and things like that. But what I get back is meanness. What's going on there? One of the things that you've probably, you can, I hope that you hold on to as you understand my understanding, my notion of what narcissism is. I define narcissism in great part as being an anti-love state of mind. Narcissists have an absence of love. They don't know how to love. They, they may think that they understand love, but all they want really is admiration and your conformity, which is not love. They don't know and they don't understand the essence of love. And so when they come at you, you've been kind, you've been friendly, and then they come back with meanness. It's their way of saying, if you think that I'm going to enter into that kind of life with you, no, I don't do that. And I'm thinking, well, why wouldn't you want to have a, ma a manner of life that's based upon love? And the answer from the narcissist, if they could be honest, is because I don't know how. It's a skill set that I simply don't possess. And it's sad and it's pitiable to realize that's what we're dealing with here. And I, I've had so many people, uh, and particularly if it's a parent or uh, let's say a sibling, that after 40 years, let's say, they realize you really don't understand love, do you? And it, it's... it's um, it's disheartening when you say, well, I have so much that I have to offer. Please join with me. And the narcissist is more or less implying, hey, look, what I want is I want the dominant position. That's good for me. And if I maintain the dominant position, let's just go ahead and call it love. And they don't know how to go into that space. And it, it illustrates that, um, that to them, your efforts to love are threatening. Uh, love implies that they have to have many other ingredients. One is vulnerability, kindness, or patience, or interest in other individuals, sacrifice, self-restraint, empathy. And uh, so when you imply, well, I'd like to be in a loving relationship, and it includes all of those healthy characteristics, the narcissist is like, no way. You, you expect me to be that? And the answer is, yeah. And because narcissists are into power and dominance and they don't realize that love itself has a form of power, but not the kind of power that they are accustomed to. Their power is uh, belittling other individuals. Your power in love is empowering other individuals. 
and, and helping uh, build their significance. Uh, that's a pattern that's completely lost on them. Okay. It's, it's really sad. Once, once you see it, you cannot uh, unsee it. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, basically this individual is, is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just committed to my anger. Now let, let that be enough. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this person says, is it normal for a narcissist to break you down, attack and belittle you? And then the next day love bomb you. Okay. And the answer is yes, uh, that can be uh, very normal. Uh, they can come on in a real mean streak and harsh and just say insulting things. And then the next time you see them, let's say this the next day, it's like, Hey, old buddy, old pal. And they, they want to, uh, to, to more or less, uh, try to get you to forget about that. It does illustrate that at some level, many of these individuals have a basic understanding of right versus wrong. In other words, you don't need to scream and insult people if you're trying to get um, uh, motivation from them. They do have that uh, at some level. Many of them, uh, it becomes so habituated to go in the other direction that they don't even think about it anymore. But at some level, they can understand right versus wrong. But the anger that's part of their uh, uh, approach toward you is so deeply entrenched. You know, anger is not uh, in the uh, the list of characteristics of a narcissist, but because of control and selfishness and manipulation and all the others, uh, uh, that's so, so deeply entrenched that anger is a natural byproduct of that. And the way I try to put it is some of these actually seem to have a commitment to their anger. It's like, well, maybe, you know, like the old uh, friend that you used to have, that's probably not very good for you, but you know, I've known them for a long time. So I still, still keep going back to them. That's kind of the pattern that narcissists will have. It's like, well, I know that, uh, uh, that my anger is probably not good for me, but I keep going back. But then they come back the next day and try to make you think, hey, no, let, let's be friends all over again. And that reveals yet another part of the narcissistic pattern. And that is, I need you for supply. And I think that I, I became dangerously close to losing my supply, which is you. And so they, they won't admit it. They probably don't have enough insight at that point to be able to say what I just said. Um, but it's their way of saying, I, I want to keep you around because I need somebody to be there with me and, and give me some attention and, and do things with me or for me or to help me out. And so you're necessary, but it's all about me. It's all about well, uh, that. And so even if they apologize, it tends to be rather shallow. And I'm going back to one of the uh, earlier questions that I answered. I want some specifics. You know, when you say uh, that you, know, you love me or you care about me, tell me what that means. And uh, let's let's talk about how that uh, relates to what happened yesterday and the meanness. Uh, uh, help me understand how you now break that down in retrospect and uh, what kind of lessons learned you might have from there and see if they can be very particular and then see if it lasts for any uh, period of time. But uh, bring, breaking you down, attacking you, and then the next day love bombing, that's way too common. It illustrates that they know the difference. Uh, but then if I'm in that position, I'm thinking, I want to know that you know, know your difference. You know, in other words, it's not just uh, short term, uh, you know, trying to butter you back up only to do it all over again and then see what patterns arise. Uh, in most cases, the, the old pattern is probably going to show up fairly soon. Okay. All right. Here, here we have another one. And the patterns just keep coming, don't they? This person says, how would you describe the scenario where you have a narcissist provoking you and falsely accusing you? And then another narcissist accuses you of not being able to get along with the first person as though it's your fault. So you have narcissist number one that says, I need to lay you low. You know, there's something really wrong with you. So they go into the insulting and, and accusing kind of mode, provoking you, as this person says. And then narcissist number two is uh, perhaps observing this and, and uh, looking at you thinking, well, dog pile, you remember that game, dog pile, and they just pile it on too. I, I kind of like the way this person thinks. And there are times when this is a birds of a feather flock together. Uh, how about narcissists of a feather flock together? 
Uh, narcissist number two is saying, well, it seemed to work pretty well for that person. So I think I'll do it too. I don't know if that's a flying monkey or I don't know if they just think of you as being somebody that's vulnerable. So they, uh, one person kicked you and got away with it. So it's like, well, I like doing that too. So they do it. But what we have here is, uh, two individuals who have no regard for you. Why does somebody feel the need to insult if they're trying to get some sort of result from you? Why does somebody need to uh, to demean you? What's their end game? And when you see that individuals are very willing to go into that space, that's an enormous red flag because there's only one real good answer for that, and that is they want dominance. And uh, dominance uh, is something that they uh, will uh, gladly go into as they diminish you. In fact, I've got another video coming up. I'm a little ahead of myself right now. Uh, about uh, the one pattern that uh, is uh, is the centerpiece of narcissism. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a heads up. It, it's the pattern of elevating yourself by diminishing others. And so many of the narcissistic behaviors uh, have that element. It's the centerpiece of what they do. I need to keep myself as a self-important kind of person. And I certainly don't mind tearing you down in order to accomplish that. And there are so many different ways that they can do this. Um, no regard for you. No thought, no curiosity about your perspective, your needs in the moments. All they want is power and dominance. And what that says is, you know, uh, these are one and then a second uh, 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 types of people. That you, it's like, you know, if, that, if that's their game, if that's their way of trying to, uh, to show some sort of power over me, I don't need to be anyone's uh, whipping post. I, I, I have to move away and then listen to what your heart is trying to tell you, because obviously they're in great pain, but instead of addressing it, they put their pain onto you and you don't need to carry that. Okay. Now this next one, I want you to see uh, how many different patterns of narcissism are in this one illustration here. And there's a bunch. Okay. Uh, this person says, why do narcissists hide things? What drives them to hurt other people by keeping them in the dark? Are narcissists so jaded that they think the more they know and you don't, that makes them morally superior. And then uh, uh, they're when in fact, they're just stupid and selfishly immature. But we're going to get to that in just a minute. Okay. They hide things. They hurt people. They try to keep them in the dark. Uh, they're jaded. Uh, they think the more they know and you don't, that makes them morally superior. Okay. Let's just look at the various patterns. First of all, you can see that this person is uh, strongly. And when I say strongly with a, with a star next to it, strongly devoted to their false self. Uh, it's their way of thinking, well, the reason I hide things and the reason I don't want you to know about me is because I, I have this veneer that I have, uh, have um, constructed. And I, I started doing that a long time ago. I don't want you to know who I am. So that's one of it. Uh, they're, they, they're propped up by their own false self. There's a passive aggressive element here. I'm going to keep you in the dark. Uh, the implication is the more you know about me, the more that bugs me. So uh, letting you know that that bugs me and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, let you uh, think that you may know who I am and oh man, I'm, I'm so much uh, in the superior position there. And so there's a passive aggressive element there. I just mentioned the third part of the pattern is they want to stay in the superior mode over you. It's like, you know, you're, you're too beneath me for me to open myself up. You're, you're just, you're down there. You're underneath me. There's another pattern. They, they, and that's high control, uh, their unwillingness to reveal who they are and their condescension toward you is it's kind of like, yeah, you see that leaves me in the control position. Ooh, I love that one. Uh, in addition, there's a defensive model that's there, uh, or pattern that's there. It's their way of saying the more I can keep the offense on you, the more I can let you think that you're the problem, then we don't have to worry about me having to reveal myself. There's another pattern, and that is their alternate reality. They have already lied to themselves before they lie to you. That's what tomorrow's uh, video is going to be about, how narcissists will lie to themselves. So the, the alternate reality is, I really need to be the better person here. I, I have to be the one who's dominant because, you see, I'm unique. 
and I'm different and whatever rules apply to all the rest of you slobs out there don't apply to me. So I just named at least a half a dozen, maybe six or seven different patterns that are part of this one element here. Do you understand these are tormented souls when they go into this kind of space? And then when someone they're hiding and they hurt and they keep you in the dark, uh, they're jaded, they're condescending. It, it, it reveals that deep down on the inside of who they are is so much unfinished business. You hear me say things like narcissists carry chaos on the inside. That's what I'm talking about here. And this is probably one of the most poignant illustrations that we have in our questions here today. So whoever sent this one in, thank you, because it illustrates, uh, know what you're up against and know that these are people who have not done their psychological homework within themselves at all. And it can come out in so many different ways. Okay. And another one. Now, uh, you, we're all going to, uh, I think, very quickly recognize th th this person's problem. And I say this kind of tongue in cheek is that they're thinking like a normal person and you're trying to apply normalcy to an abnormal situation. This person says, Dr. C, why do narcissists, after they've done something evil, act so innocent and helpless? Uh, is it from, is it, uh, it is from raging villain to helpless victim. Does this show a conscience? And, and again, uh, there are times when they can have that conscience, um, but they can do something really evil and then they can act so uh, innocent later on. It, it does illustrate that they know I kind of blew it. Uh, let me give you an illustration. Uh, this is at least 25 or so years ago. Jennifer and I were on a group vacation tour. And there was this one guy that was kind of, um, I'm not going to say he was totally in charge, but uh, he was sort of um, making sure that everybody knew, you know, the bus to get on and where we're going to go uh, here uh, to there. And something went wrong. And that fella went outside and there was a person that was part of the tour company uh, that helped set it up. And this fella started uh, pointing his finger and we were all in the bus watching and we couldn't hear all of the words, all this pretty loud screaming at this guy about how he was incompetent and no good. And I mean, he just made a complete fool of himself and he just laid into this um, person that worked for the uh, tour company and um, they eventually got everything corrected. But then he came back and sat on the bus. Nobody said a word. A little bit later on, several hours later, that guy approached me. And he started justifying. It's like, well, I wasn't really that mad. You know, I, you know sometimes you just kind of have to let folks know, you know, that you know they just need to pay attention. That's all I was doing. And he started minimizing greatly. And I'm thinking, uh, 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 you made a complete and total jackass of yourself, and you know you did. But it was kind of his way of saying, um, I, I know that I have problems but I can't admit that I have problems. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll throw a little bit of acknowledgement. And, and by the way, this is a guy that I had contact with uh, as the years passed by. And I can promise you that wasn't the last time he did something like that. And so th their image uh, that they portray is very important. And this guy knew that he had uh, blown his image, uh, but he had to have that dominance. He was highly condescending and he was trying to come back and, and quickly rework his image. And it just doesn't work that way. So uh, this person who is asking the questions, after they've done something evil, they can act innocent and helpless. Uh, what's going on here? Does this show a conscience? And the answer is kind of, sort of, but not really. I mean, it, it does show that they understand right and wrong. And, uh, and he made a fool, but it's not coming from a place of deep introspection. It's coming from a place of uh, image control. And that's another pattern that's extremely common within narcissism. And I'm guessing that you all have had uh, some individuals in your personal life who've done something of a very similar nature. I mean, it, it makes you shake your head when you think that don't expect me to, uh, to buy into that BS whenever you come back and say, ah, oh, it's just kidding. Or it wasn't as bad as they say, it, uh, as everybody wants to make it out when you're thinking, Oh yes, it was. And if you're not going to pull the wool over my eyes, I'm not going to let you get away with that. Okay. Um, okay. Another question. And, and I put this right back to back. This, this other person says the narcissists feel that acting humble and helpless like a victim makes up for their wrongdoing. That's another question. And the answer is yes. Um, uh, the, they, they try to, uh, uh, to make themselves look better than they are, but again, it's part of their self lying. And, um, they, the, the lie that they're telling themselves is, 
Well, if I have one moment, one episode of humility with you, then that makes up for 10 episodes of um, just raw egotism. And so they do all this rationalization within themselves. So that's another part of their pattern. It's their defense mechanism. They, they rationalize. Okay. Now we have another. This person says nobody is perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Okay. And then go, uh, she goes into the question, why is it so hard for the narcissist to admit that? Immaturity and lack of a, of a larger world perspective is my hypothesis. And my response is, your hypothesis is straight on. Immaturity and a lack of a larger world perspective. Um, when you have a person that just can't admit, you know, I, I make mistakes or I have my flaws or my weaknesses or I have some strengths, but I have some blind spots too. When they just can't be honest, they only want you to see the, the supposedly uh, good or superior things. It illustrates that they just don't have good insight. Um, there's a, um, th there's just a, a reality. We're all a mixed bag. You've heard me say before, I believe in what we call the duality of humanity. We are capable of good and positive ingredients. We're capable of, of negative to the point of even evil ingredients. We all have that propensity. Healthy individuals see it and they make, um, uh, you know, a concerted effort to stay in the healthy and good and uh, positive direction. Uh, narcissists is like, well, I don't want to have to do that because that makes me vulnerable. And uh, I've, I've worked so hard to craft my own public persona that I don't want to have to do that. And so tearing you down as, uh, as, as they try to uh, keep their image propped up is one of the, the most common patterns that they'll get into. It's just what they do. It's central to their, uh, their narcissism and their way of life. Okay, I have one more, and uh, we'll close with this one. Uh, this person asks, what does it mean when a narcissist will go to any length to avoid you, no matter where you are? I'm not sure if I should take that as a win, but it sure feels like it for the time being. So you have somebody that uh, was apparently a part of your life, and uh, you must have had some, uh, whether it's at work or in the family or uh, social, whatever, and then uh, after something happens, then you realize, oh, they're playing the hide and seek game left and right. We're going to go to this event and they avoid me or they won't look at me or they won't talk to me. They just won't, uh, won't show up. Um, my guess is the narcissist, when, you, uh, w when they know that they've been very inappropriate and, and it's just turned out to be a pretty sour relationship, in their mind, it might be that they're thinking, I know that you're on to me, or uh, I know that maybe even you may be a bit wiser than me or more uh, uh, well received by other individuals than me, but they will not admit it. They can't say, uh, hey, look, I know that when I was with you, I had a whole pattern of, of living that was completely inappropriate. I'd like to apologize. I want to ask your forgiveness, and I'm going to do A, B, and C to illustrate to you that I, I want to make that up. They can't do it. Now, the fact that they're avoiding everything they do communicates something. It's their way of implying. I, I realize that uh, that, that you you uh, you you know things about me that I don't want anybody else to know. So they're just staying away from you. Um, but uh, we can say that their evasiveness is il illustrative of two of the common patterns of narcissism. One, it's their way of saying I live with a great deal of fear which is why they have to keep that veneer up. I don't want anybody to know. And then second, I must be in control. And so the, the, the fear of being uh, discovered and the need to control equals all sorts of defensive and evasive gestures. And there you have it. So as I was going through all of these questions here earlier today and, and just looking and seeing what our uh, theme is, and that is there are so many persistent patterns that these people live with I hope that it helps you understand when you're dealing with these kind of individuals, you may walk away thinking, well, things didn't go very well. Am I the problem? Because narcissists want you to think that. But uh, I'm hoping the more you see there's so much raging on the inside of that person, I'm going to use that word chaos again. There's so much chaos on the inside of them that they're not able to come to terms with uh, who they are, but 
rather than saying, I need to take responsibility, what they do is they put it onto you and you need to take responsibility for all the disgruntled feelings I'm having. And you know what we're going to do here on Team Healthy? We're going to say, I'm taking a pass on that. Uh, you have your chaos, you have your patterns, you have your uh, tendencies, and you just keep going back to it. The old, the old uh, uh, proverb about the dog that goes back to its vomit. <sighs> I'm not going to go back and do that. Thanks, but no thanks. I, I have better things to do with my life. I am going to uh, take stock of who I am, take inventory, and I'm going to make some adjustments that you're probably not, not going to be able to appreciate. That's where you are. But I stand for DRC, Dignity respect and civility. Are you with me on that one, Team Healthy? Now, when I was reading through this, I knew, ooh, I, we've got some really good questions here today. So uh, keep putting your questions out there, put them underneath the, the comments section and uh, pass along the uh, the videos to friends and family, if you will. Uh, we, we love having new people come aboard and uh, yeah, I just love uh, being able to give a message of hope and encouragement. So uh, I appreciate you being who you are. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing what we're going to come up with in our next broadcast you know, live uh, next Wednesday. I hope you have a good rest of the week and I'll see you next time. Bye.